Welcome to Rosalind, British Columbia. I'm Tracy Saxby and I'm the co-founder of Greener Footprint Society, a not-for-profit organization that we started in 2005 to help reduce plastic shopping bag use in Canada. So how did this even start? How did this happen? How did one person try to convince an entire town to reduce their plastic shopping bag use? I was pretty upset about the state of the world. I felt like things were going in a direction that I didn't like. I was a bit of a couch environmentalist. I was sitting back and criticizing all the time, but not actually doing anything about it. So I decided that if I wanted things to change, then I had to change them. I started doing some research. I started finding out why plastic bags were a problem, and I started trying to figure out solutions and alternatives to them. And that's really how it all began. Canadians use more than 9 billion plastic shopping bags every single year. And that's a pretty big number to think about. So if you break that down on a minute by minute basis, it works out at about 17,000 bags every single minute. That's a lot of plastic bags. Plastic bags are made from oil or coal or natural gas. And our society is at a turning point where we really need to reduce our use of these fossil fuels. So reducing our use of plastic shopping bags is a great first step towards that. The average plastic bag is only used for about five minutes to take your groceries from the supermarket to your home. But the reality is that this plastic bag is gonna be around for up to a thousand years and they never fully break down. When you see plastic breaking into smaller pieces, it's a process called photodegradation. It's a chemical reaction between sunlight and the plastic and it just breaks into smaller and smaller pieces. And these toxic pieces then end up in our waterways, our streams, our rivers. Uh, animals accidentally mistake them for food and ingest them, and so they end up in our food chain as well. Plastic bags have been banned in a number of other countries all around the world because they're a huge litter problem. But another reason is because they've been linked to causing flooding when they block drains. Uh, this happened in Bangladesh, where plastic bags essentially dammed the entire river that runs through the capital city, leading to massive floods and loss of life. If you take a walk around the streets of your local town, you'll see an awful lot of litter, whether it's plastic bags or other kind of garbage. If you think about it, because plastic is so lightweight, it gets transported really easily by wind and water. So as soon as it rains or if it's a little bit windy, it'll get picked up and carried out into our creeks and rivers and oceans. Plastic bags have been documented to kill both wildlife and livestock, and they're particularly deadly in our oceans. If you think of a plastic bag in the ocean, it kind of looks like a jellyfish. So dolphins and turtles and whales will eat it thinking that it's food, but this is deadly. It only takes about six plastic bags to kill a turtle. What happens with turtles in particular is they'll, they'll eat the plastic bag and it'll get stuck in their digestive tract and they'll slowly starve to death. When a plastic bag is in the ocean, it's somewhere for fish to hide. So you have a plastic bag in the ocean, it's creating a shadow, you've got fish underneath it. A seabird flying above just sees the fish, they don't really notice the plastic bag. So they'll dive down, their beak will go through the plastic bag and then they're trapped and they'll, they'll either drown or in some cases they might survive, but you get to see them and they, they can't really fly, they can't eat properly, they can't function properly. So they often die. Plastic bags are collected in some jurisdictions, and in fact in half of this region we collect them, in the western half. It's all a matter of whether you have a uh, collector that can take them and has a market for them. And traditionally it's been difficult to get enough bags together, and it was just one more thing that we had to add to the mix in either a depot system, where we started of course, or in a curbside system, so it kind of complicates the issue. but. It was mainly a matter of not having markets. And of course, that a plastic bag isn't a plastic bag a pla is a plastic bag. They're different kinds. 
So it just complicates it again. It's the whole issue with plastics in general that there are so many different kinds of resins that it makes it hard to separate them out. It's not like a tin can, which is a tin can and can be recycled as such, or a glass jar. It's easy to tell uh, which product, which material is which material. It's not so with plastic. So one of the first things that I did in Rosalind was I just started talking to people. I talked to people in government, I talked to local retailers, I talked to friends, I talked to people in the community and just got a feel for, okay, how can we do this? How can we make this happen? And, and started building that network of support as well. The Plastic Bag Initiative did really well in Rosalind because of the people that were behind the project. They were so enthusiastic. They were highly effective in engaging the, the community, they went to the high schools, they dealt professionally with the city council, they dealt professionally with the businesses in town, they were thoughtful about when they approached the businesses and um, considered what it would be for them to remove plastic bags from their system. Ferraro's, our, our local market, was right on board because for them it was a huge benefit. They, they are the biggest purchaser of plastic bags in town. So for them to be able to cut down on what they needed to buy to serve their customers was a really good thing. So they were very supportive from the start. Well, certainly when I first heard about the initiative, I was very happy to, to, to be presented with an option as, you know, as a local business uh, retailer to, to be able to send somebody out with a bag that uh, wasn't plastic and something that they could reuse again and again approaching the city councils and getting political buy-in and then approaching merchants and getting uh, the buy-in from the retail sector were both critical so that the, the local government didn't think that they were uh, perhaps stepping on retail toes and that they would be uh, alienating their constituency. Then for the, the retailers to see that, that it was supported by local government just built a nice um, coalition that would would make the whole thing move forward more uh, cohesively. You know, there's no question that Rosalind, uh, you know, it's a small community, easy to get communication out. Uh, we didn't, we had retailers and uh, business people that were sensitive to the community's uh, needs, their trends, their choices. And I think that, uh, you know, politically it was a fairly soft initiative. Didn't require a whole lot of, of uh, arm twisting. And I think that, uh, you know, politically uh, the politicians saw it as a good initiative without having a strong arm and they felt that education and sort of a softer approach to the community and to its citizens would be, uh, you know, a fairly easy way to do it. One of the coolest things in Roslyn is that it really did generate a huge amount of interest straight away. I sent out one email and I got hundreds of replies with people that were keen to uh, just to help out and, and make this happen. So it was just amazing response. Well, I got involved with Greener Footprints actually because I had heard Tracy speak to the community in just sort of a general general meeting and talking about the idea. And of course, I'd, I'd been familiar with the issue and I thought, wow, this is great. This is a great thing to get involved with and Roslyn would be a perfect opportunity for this to, to happen because it's a small community, fairly progressive. People are interested in these kinds of ideas and I felt we could pull it off here. Well, we did have huge amounts of volunteers that were interested in helping out. Set up a volunteer list. Uh, people can sign up and say, yeah, I'm actually really keen to help. And that was one of the coolest things in Roslyn is that we had so many volunteers and everybody wanted to get involved. So one of the key things that you want to do is that you want to get this team together. You want to build a team and you want to delegate. Delegating is really important. I became involved because it was something that I had a, a big interest in and I, I knew that it was feasible to do it, but I didn't have the means to do it. And so it was nice for me to get behind someone like Tracy who had the energy, who had the vision, and she has a lot of tools to make it happen and to, and to get volunteers behind her and she proved that. We couldn't have done it without all the community involvement that we had. Um, Tracy galvanized the community, got a lot of people to come out and sign up to help, 
And then when we got actually to implementing, we used all kinds of people for all sorts of different things. The group of volunteers got together, first of all, to plan how each one of us could take a certain segment of the task and, and take it on and hopefully make it happen. We have to go at it from a, a whole different group of, of people in the town. We got the seniors on board, we got business people on board. So if, if a community is starting this, they need to sit down and get that, that committee of people who will address every different level of the society in the community. When it comes from the community, uh, because it's our neighbors, our friends, our family, we're much more likely to buy in, uh, we're much more likely to invest in it, uh, and because we see, you know, that others that are important to us, including our own community. I mean, it's the people, right? It's not, it's not the place.